I'm Eddie Brock. I'm a reporter. I always seem to find myself questioning something the government may not be looking at. I found something really bad. And I have been... Eddie. Who said that? Who said that? Who said that? Taken. around in the world, what do you see? A planet on the brink of collapse. Human beings are disposable, but man and symbiote combined. This is a new race, a new species, a higher life form. What do you want from me? You'll find out. I'm so sorry. We cannot just hurt people. Look into my eyes, Eddie. The way I see it, we can do whatever we want. Do we have a deal? Eyes, lungs, pancreas, so many snacks for a little time. That power, it's not completely awful. You have no idea how much you're scaring me right now. Eddie, cooperate. And you just might survive. Guys, you do not want to do this, trust me. Giant leaps will always come at a cost. Say, yeah. Name is Chen. You are listening to Joingasm, a video game and movie podcast. I'm Russ, Xbox Live Toaster 360. He is Steve, Xbox Live Stevevich, and we can do whatever we want in episode 128 today, June 27th, 2019. We are going to skip our howdy duty time as well as boomy news and gaming news to get right into the main event. Our topic of the day is the Venom movie review. And I think that it is worth saying here at this point that when this film was first teased, I was very excited for it. We. I'm sorry, Steve. We. Thank you. We're very excited about it. And then the and following then trailer came you out. You happened. What do you mean that I have? I will still want to see it in the theater. Thank you very much. But continue. You oh, said no. Oh, oh, well, well. I had seen the, the following trailer, and all of a sudden, it didn't have the same level of impact as the, tr- as the teaser trailer did. And so I started to lose interest in it. And then I started getting influenced by some of the reviews that were popping up online. And so I, I ended up just not going to see this film in the theater and, and uh, neither did you. And so yeah, because of you, thank you. I know I, I, I fully take responsibility and this, this, uh, what I'm trying to say, Steve, is that I was mistaken. Mm -hmm. I was so mistaken and I am so glad that, just I just happened to be kind of scrubbing through the the Xbox store and seeing what kind of movies are out there. And I thought to myself, you know, 
I think I'm going to give this film a shot. I want to see what's going on. And actually, when I was making that decision, I was on my phone and I was looking and I noticed that there was a headline saying how um, there's a sequel that's currently being made for Venom 2 and that Tom Hardy is back for Venom 2. So I thought, okay, if they're making a sequel and if Tom Hardy is back on board again, I think I need to see this. And I am so glad that I did. And I, and I think it just teaches me a good lesson about just going with your gut. Like don't let outside reviews or, or influences end up having a, a, a bearing on my decision to see or not see something based on what my gut tells me to do. But uh, I think because this film came out, it came out last year, right? Yes. So I think we can forego the spoiler free version because there's been enough time, yeah, sure. you know, uh, for people who wanted to see it in the theater sure. to see it and that sure. sort of thing. And, uh, and I think it's fun. You know, we typically, we have our episodes coincide with various types of events or things that are happening that are much more current. However, I think that this particular film deserves our analysis. So I say we go right into just a spoiler drill down review of this film. Ah. But I would like to start off with high level thoughts. Just initially, just right off the top of your head. Steve, what do you think of the movie? Well, I enjoyed it. I think they got the movement of Venom down. Uh, I mean, when I was, you read more of the Spider-Man comic books. Oh, yeah. I, I f literally just like flipped through and was like, oh, here's Spider-Man. Hey. <laughs> you know, slings around New York webs and stuff. But when I saw Venom, I was like, yeah, that is, uh, that's an interesting kind of, you know, semi-villain, I guess. And uh, the way he was drawn and the way he would move about the city, the, that, that movement was captured, it seemed like, in the movie. Yes, absolutely. I, you know, watching the, the character of Venom in this film, I was, as a fan of the Spider-Man comic books, and, you know, Venom, of course, is one of the most popular villains in the world of Spider-Man. I was very happy with the way they represented Venom. Way more than how Venom was initially represented in the older Sam Raimi. Um, I think it was like Topher. Uh, I can't remember his last name, but the guy who who played Eddie Brock in Spider Man Three. Uh, yeah, that, I, it I, was terrible. That's forgettable. Yeah, I, I literally don't remember anything except for him when they gave him like pointy teeth at some point. Right. I'm like, you know, nah, that doesn't work. It was so bad was and terrible. And I, you know, I like the actor in other roles, but I felt he was miscast in that particular role. Tom Hardy though is a perfect. And I, even when we, when we saw the teaser trailer to this film, this is one of the comments at the forefront that we had was like, Oh my gosh, like Tom Hardy as Eddie Brock fits. Yeah. Like I, we like, that was one of the big things that excited us. So continue. Sorry. So also what I was relieved about was that, uh, with the CG, uh, you, they didn't make him Gumby looking. They didn't like stretch him when he jumped or when he punched or anything. He had the, the weight and that inertia when if you jumped and he had, uh, that mass when he yeah. punched and kicked and, uh, you know, flying about. And I, I appreciate that. I'm glad somebody behind the computer screen can get that, uh, that weight and that movement transferred down. Mm -hmm. Um, man, I wish we was on the theater because when they had his voice echo yeah. in his brain, I thought that was really cool. I thought, uh, had that be you or I with a voice in our head, we'd hear it all around. I mean, that's oh, yeah. like your inner voice, but very loud and echoing in your dome. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So I thought that was very cool. Um, I think they got the look of Venom down. Oh, yeah. Pat. Yes. Uh, so that made me very, very happy. Um, I liked how they took their time, at least for the first half of the movie, they really took their time. Like, as like Batman Begins took their time with Bruce Wayne in a right. sense. I mean, I'm not trying to compare both movies, but uh, with with an origin story like this, I feel it's very important. You don't need to have a very high action blockbuster explosions here and there. I want to know about Eddie Brock. I want to know where he came from. I want to know about his life. I want to know why he became what he became. That's what this should be all about. And, and I remember reading the reviews before, um, or I actually more like skin skimmed them, but <laughs> <laughs> I to be honest, but it didn't seem like all this criticism really made much sense. And I wonder if the, the critics really wanted another Thor or another Iron Man or another kind of Marvel, parade kind of movie 
uh, which this is not. But I didn't want a movie like that when I watch a movie about Venom. Right. You know what I mean? I don't have to have all this color parade stuff <laughs> when I watch a comic book movie. I don't need it. Yeah, it was very confusing to me when the the reviews were coming out because you had a lot of the, the critics who were panning it saying, oh, it's not very good and all this stuff. But then there was this other type of thing where you had the fans go and actually... I mean, I talked to quite a few of my friends who saw it and, and they were trying to get me to go see it because they, th- they said, this is actually a good film. This is better than what they're making it out to be. And I was reading somewhere, I think um, I think the, the movie itself cost around $100 million to make. And I think it grows something like $205 million something like that. So, I mean, it made its money back and then made gravy on top of it, which was good. I I don't know if that's like, like a a exactly correct number or not, but, um, it was, yeah, it it was crazy to me watching this film. First of all, I love watching Tom Hardy. I, I think that, um, if it, if Tom Hardy wasn't in this film, it would not have been as believable. Right. And I think that that I totally agree with you. Like the the look of Venom is spot on. The movement of Venom, especially, they nailed. Like I was I was so happy watching this movie and seeing how his appendages kind of moved around right. and that sort of thing. Even um, the idea of seeing other symbiotes that were from his world, I thought that was really neat too. And. Um, I mean, even Michelle Williams, who played the love interest, I, I thought she was good. I, I And we'll get more into the, the plot here in just a sec. But um, no, overall, I highly recommend this film. I, th- I think that it is a lot of fun. I think it's original in its setup. And it's just really honest with the source material. So jumping into the plot itself. What I thought was interesting was how they actually did not go the same route as the comic books. Because in the comic books, what happens is, is that the symbiote actually um, bonds with Peter Parker. Like in Spider-Man 3? Uh, Yeah, kind of like in Spider-Man 3. Um, Yeah, they they had... I I hate to say that because it really wasn't a very good representation from the comics. It was really, really bad. But the general premise is, is that... Peter Parker is the first human that the symbiote comes into contact with and bonds with. And actually there is a type of, um, attraction almost like, like it's, it's one of the, the defining characteristics of the symbiote is that the longer it stays with a host, the host almost has like this, like desire to stay with the symbiote. And that was the big thing within the comic books was that Peter Parker for a, a while um, was with the symbiote, but then he realized that, that this was not a good match, how the symbiote was taking advantage of him and all this other stuff. And so um, eventually he was able to get himself away from the symbiote. And then the symbiote goes and finds Eddie Brock and, you know, happens to, to find this, this guy, this guy named Eddie Brock. This and guy. Then, this one guy. And then bonds with Eddie and Eddie fully embraces the, the symbiote itself. And then that's when the whole venom thing starts up. And there's also a complicated history between Peter Parker and Eddie Brock and that sort of thing. So like you kind of see it in Spider-Man three, but I, I like I said, I don't want to make um, any kind of direct comparisons with that just because it just was not, in my opinion, it was not a, a good uh, representation of that. So going back to this film, they completely changed the story in terms of, now we have this spaceship that's coming back to earth with these multiple symbiotes. It crash lands and they're taking these samples and that sort of thing. Very, very different. Or more like a shuttle. Yeah. Like space shuttle. Yeah. Kind of sh- yeah. Space shuttle. Yeah. And, um, and so that, that part was risky because even like a fan like myself, I'm watching this, I'm thinking, okay, this is not like the comic <laughs> book. And normally I'm a purist. Like I'm like, do not deviate from the source material. I think what's interesting about this, though, is that you could tell they wanted to make their origin story for Venom and how can they make this work without bringing Spider-Man into the mix? Because obviously, 
given what's happening with the MCU currently, you know, they're using Peter Parker for the Avengers in game right. and all that kind of stuff. So it really doesn't fit in terms of the timetable, but I didn't want to really want to see Spider-Man in a Venom origin story though. I mean, I think it, I, I guess it would have been a okay. It would have been cool, but I, more of me did not want to see Spider-Man come flinging through. Well, and like I was thinking that a, a way that perhaps they could have done it is for Spider-Man homecoming because that came out around the same time as Venom if they had Venom be the main villain in Spider-Man Homecoming, and then he's able to reject it, the, the symbiote, that sort of thing. And then it sets up the standalone film of Venom. I think that could have worked, but at the same time, it's like Spider-Man Homecoming was such a good movie too, right. with Michael Keaton as the vulture. It's like, well, I didn't I don't want to take that away. You know, I, I mean, I suppose there could have been some kind of rearranging of just how they're doing their, their character arcs. Um, with the kind of the global look of, of all these different films. Having said that, though, overall, I didn't mind it. I just went along with it with this film. Did you go along with it? Of course. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, just just looking at what's happening. I mean, like, just, just it, it was really cool, actually, to see the film take place in San Francisco. Um, and I think that that, you know, typically speaking, Eddie Brock is from New York. And if you notice, right. Tom Hardy still adopted kind of that East coast accent. <laughs> yeah. And again, it's taking kind of like those creative um, liberties with this because typically Eddie Brock in the comic book, he works in New York. Right. And they make references to that. And there were how like he got fired from the daily globe and that sort of thing. Well, that's Spider-Man, you know, that's where Peter Parker works sometimes. But, but I also thought that was refreshing to have it not be again, in New York. Like, oh, let's look at something different. Okay, different city, different atmosphere, San Francisco, fine. I That's believable. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, and it, it was, I agree. I think it was really refreshing to see uh, San Fran as the, the main place. And it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've been there. <laughs> Home. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, it, it was a lot of fun to be able to, to see that setting. And I liked... Um, also just like the pacing of it where like it wasn't just venom immediately like they like you said they had a, a kind of a building up throughout probably half the movie which was great because it's character development for Eddie Brock like you you um, end up empathizing and sympathizing with Eddie Brock and and some of the and the I flaws like of too. his character yeah yeah, yeah yeah totally I mean he he is a likable guy he's relatable and seeing him down on his luck and everything else and then you see this thing happen. I um, absolutely loved the relationship between Venom and Eddie Brock. It was, I mean, there was, again, I feel like this is almost like a tightrope walk in terms of how it could either be really, really good or really, really bad. And I think that there are um, temptations to want to kind of go all out, like go pure evil or have Venom just take over Eddie Brock and that sort of thing. But that's too shallow. That's that's one dimensional storytelling. And I loved how there was actually I mean, there was a bond. And, and I think that the filmmakers were exploring the word bond in all senses of it, where it's like you have this symbiote alien organism that like needs a host in order to survive. And so it bonds with Eddie Brock. At the same time, there is this kind of almost like um, relationship, emotional bonding that's going on as well, where they have an understanding with each other and how they can coexist. And how um, what's interesting is that there is also this fun flirtation, if you will, where you're not quite sure if Venom is being truthful with Eddie or if right. he's just trying to say what Eddie wants to hear. Right. But then he sometimes backs up what he's saying with his actions in terms of saving Eddie. But at the same time, it's like, well, of course, because he needs a host and Eddie is like the perfect host for Venom. Right. I absolutely love that. Yeah, I thought that was neat too. Uh, because yeah, he constantly, Eddie refers to Venom as the parasite. And yes, a parasite's going to use the host. And if the parasite's big enough, it kills the host and has to move on. But in this case, uh, <laughs> we are we are bad hosts for the parasite to live. So finding another perfect host is going to be very few and far between. So he has to make Eddie live instead of kill him, or else Venom is going to be nothing uh, without Eddie. Right. So together, they're very strong. It's like if you take two L's, Russ, because they they were they refer to themselves as losers. <laughs> Both Venom and Eddie's are like, oh yeah, we're we're you know we're kind of outcasts, we're losers. Yeah. You take one L. 
You take another L and you flip it around. You kind of tilt them. What does that make? A, a W? A W. They become a winner. Oh. <laughs> or one might say <laughs> they become we. Oh, I need to make a correction, by the way. The 200 million that I was talking about was just domestically here in the United States. Mm. There, With a combined total, it actually made over $822 million globally. That's... So apparently... Uh, international critics uh, were more correct than our domestic critics. Yes, it made six hundred eleven million dollars internationally in terms of you know not not counting the United States. But wow, like that that film Venom almost made a billion dollars. That's that's insane, actually. If you yes. think about Avengers Endgame, is as popular as it is and as huge and money thrown at it as it, as it is. And then you take this, which was an outcast. Yeah. So like I was just saying, um, that's, that's, I, I can't believe that. that well, but I, that's great news. It, yeah. It's very great news because again, this is a, a success story in my opinion of a studio taking a risk because if you think about it, no one had made a film that stars a villain. That's right. an anti-hero. Yeah. You know, it's, it's very different than the typical superhero films that you go out and see. So, um, while Venom is probably one of the most popular characters in comic books, still, I don't know how much of a following it had in terms of being able to bring people to the theater to watch it other than like, you know, the hardcore fans, but that's, that's very encouraging to, to check out. So what did you think of the, um, the way that, like the film progressed with the antagonist? You have, you have this guy who's kind of almost like, a um, uh, you know, Steve Jobs esque kind of character who's like into tech and knows how to say all the right things and change the world. You know, we've Elon heard that. Musk, yeah, 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 well, tons of times. And then he ends up coming um, in contact with Riot, who is like the the, the team leader of the symbiotes. Um, what what did you think of of uh, of his character? You know, I thought he was he was. Um at least scripted very well. I, 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 he was very believable as far as the leader. And, and like you said, saying a lot of these charismatic things that get people to be a team and, and do his, his bidding very uh, much a manipulator, very much a manipulator. And you could tell that if he was a perfect host for these parasites, uh, you know, he would gladly do it. And he did. Yeah. Uh, so I thought his character was scripted well. And I thought his, his character was definitely believable. Um, I found it interesting where, you know, Eddie Brock is, you know, more of a beefy guy. You could, you tell he was working out. He mm -hmm. has done. That's how he is in the stuff. comics too. Yeah, exactly. And then this guy, um, you know, he's, he's probably eats healthy, but I mean, he's not the workout type, <laughs> he's you know, more of uh, the vegetarian <laughs> type, more of the vegan <laughs> slender scrawny San Franciscan that we've all come to know and love. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, he takes on the more powerful character and of course he, hundred percent embraces it and flaunts it. And, uh, I don't know. It was just that, that, that opposites, uh, attract in the sense. I was really glad that they had another symbiote in this film. Cause when I saw the, the second trailer, that's one of the things that actually caused me to lose interest. I'm like, wait, why are there like multiple symbiotes? Actually, I, I never saw that in the second trailer. You didn't? I don't think I saw it. I, I didn't know who the villain was going to be. I know he was going to fight actually. In the trailer itself, there is this one moment it's toward the end of the trailer, but it's during that epic fight scene between the, the two symbiotes and they do that slow motion thing where you kind of see Eddie Brock as well as the, the life. By dude. the way, that was so well done. That was, <laughs> it beautiful. really was. Yeah. That, that was just, I mean, I, I, I've seen it twice now and both times I'm just like, Man, this this is just a, it's gorgeous. Yeah, like Man. It, it was totally believable, and I absolutely loved just this like alien. It felt alien in terms of the fighting itself, where like you could tell they were trying to rip each other off of their hosts. Yeah, it was it was really really cool. It would be neat if there, if there were if like Prime One uh, made some sort of statue that showed the, just that sequence. You yeah. know, a still of that that would be incredible. Yeah, that would be really, really cool. And I like, too, um, about Riot. I thought, it, I don't know if Riot is in the comics or they just made it for the film, but I did appreciate how he had different abilities, how um, Venom was more limited in terms of 
what he knew how to do with like just just his appendages and, and that sort of thing. And even leading up to the fight to Riot, there was quite a bit that Venom did that you're just like, wow, this is impressive. And then you see what Riot can do and you're like, whoa. And honestly, when I saw Riot for the first time, I was thinking, man, a lot of what you see is what Carnage does. And Carnage um, is, of course, in the comic books, it, it makes... Carnage makes Venom look tame almost by comparison because Carnage is just absolutely all about just killing anything and everything and doing it in a very uh, gruesome way. I mean, it's 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 pretty brutal in the comics how he dispatches uh, hapless victims. I I remember flipping through and seeing some of that stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah, but there's at the, at the same time there is strength with Venom. There, well, there's strength with both because. Uh, Riot was uh, more weapon based, mm-hmm. but uh, maybe slower. Um, Venom was more agile. Yeah, agile. There you go. And <laughs> but had but was quicker and was more stretchy. And, <laughs> <laughs> and with it, we know it you know, with his appendages and whatever, like you said. Uh-huh. So there is something to be said for both because. Venom could do stuff that Riot couldn't do, and Riot could do stuff that Venom couldn't do. Mm-hmm. So, um, kind of a kind of a nice little matchup. Backing up a bit, I want to talk about the psychiatry be, like between Venom and Eddie, and I really think that that it, it's neat to be able to watch them have these conversations with each other. And it's, I don't know, like, I just really think that from a storytelling perspective, I, for one, really learned to just enjoy watching the two of them go through these different types of experiences together. And I liked how Venom, because he was able to read Eddie's mind and like... Which was cool. Know what's going on. Yeah, I mean, there's a brutal honesty that manifested itself where Eddie really couldn't disguise anything and Eddie of course was kind of going along with it too and I don't know I just I really liked how there was like this you you could see how the the desire to stay together was growing like there was a stronger and stronger bond that was occurring and what was weird I don't know if you felt this but as a viewer I was also feeling like I was starting to bond with Venom and, and Eddie Brock, like almost as a third party. Or that I wanted them to be together. Yeah. Like, yeah. like there was this weird, like attraction or desire to like want them to stay together, which is, I mean, I, I'm sure that was not by mistake. And I think that that is also a byproduct of fabulous storytelling because that is an ongoing theme with the symbiotes. I mean, it, even in the comic books, Spider-Man was really struggling to part with the symbiote because there is this evil nature kind of, yeah. yeah, this really seductive attraction that's there. Um, but he was able to realize that Venom was just starting to just take over everything of Peter Parker. So it was, it was neat that like I had that too. I'm like, like I, I just enjoyed watching Venom do all kinds of things uh, with, uh, with Eddie and of course find themselves in some funny situations too. And some of the banter going back and forth was funny because Venom didn't know all the ins and outs. Cause obviously he had never been to earth before. And I, I just, I, I don't know. I, I thought it was really entertaining. Well, I thought it was neat too, that, uh, you know, obviously Venom is evil. He's a bad guy uh, for the most part, but with those conversations between Eddie and Venom back and forth. Um, It wasn't like, you know, do us, do my bidding or I shall kill you. Mm -hmm. You know, they had this conversation of look, okay. Originally I came here to, (laughs) you know, obliterate your planet, but I think you guys are kind of interesting and I want to stay. And when I want to figure everything out, you know, I kind of like it here. Um, But, uh, (laughs) <laughs> I don't know. There was there was a very interesting conversation between Eddie and Venom. Of look, I know you're on the downside. I'm on the downside. I need you, and I think pretty much you need me, and I think you like me. And it was weird seeing him negotiate. Yeah. But um, they did it so well in the fact that uh, it wasn't like a high level intelligent conversation, but it was a very kind of heart to heart. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It was weird. It was interesting though. And I also, too, I liked how there was that scene where there's a a period of time where Eddie is separated from Venom. 
and and it's when Eddie realizes that Venom is is essentially consuming slowly his insides and stuff because Venom needs to eat and everything else. And so he had that very blunt conversation as Venom was back to being a symbiote against that, that window and how he's like, you were actually killing me, you know, like, like that whole thing. And I think that also made Venom kind of think twice about what's going on, but cause it's weird. Cause like you had that, but then also there were moments of conviction with Venom. We're like, in that same scene before they were separated, they were talking about how Eddie's heart was starting to atrophy and everything else. And, and Venom was very passionate about saying, no, I can fix that. I can fix you. That was so cool. Yeah. I, I, and I, I thought, okay, you know, he's just saying that, but the way I don't, maybe it was, it was, um, what's the actress name? I'm sorry. Who, Tom Hardy? Tom Hardy. When he was just that Tom Hardy was doing both voices and that's why it made sense and that's why it was so convincing as me being the viewer. But when he said that, being that that Venom was the villain, I thought, no, he's lying. But because Tom Hardy was the one who said it and it matched Tom Hardy's character, obviously, in both both roles, there was a a pause of, okay, maybe he is going to tell the truth. Maybe there's something more to this. Yeah. Yeah, and, and there were multiple instances of that throughout the movie where they were having these conversations and then all of a sudden, like for instance, um, Venom was actually very transparent when they were in the car with Eddie's love interest and the, he revealed to her about how like certain frequencies of sound are very painful and, and, and detrimental to Venom. Yeah. And then Venom voluntarily said, and fire. Like, yeah. like he was just really scared about, you know, not having fire around him or anything like that. So again... There's like I get it goes back to that that comment I made earlier about there's this this fun flirtation that's going on with do you or do you not trust the symbiote because there are times when the symbiote is totally transparent and honest but then there's other times too where it's like well there is a dependency that's there because you're not going to survive without a host that you match with and clearly you match with Eddie so of course you're going to say things to get him to stick with you. Right. So, Oh, what else can we talk about for this film? Steve? Well, I thought it was interesting too the way, um, Eddie Brock looks from the beginning of the movie on pretty much through the rest until the end where he just looks like crap. Yeah. I mean, he looks pale. I mean, he looks, maybe he, he didn't say he was losing sleep, but you can tell maybe it was just stress that he was under, um, he had that all five o'clock kind of shadow going on. I'm like, bro, yeah, you he, gotta he clean pasty. yourself up, man. I mean, this girl's with you, but you look like a dump. Yeah. Um, and by the end, he looked like, you know, I'm not gonna say a million bucks, but he looked healthy again. Yeah. And and I think there there is something to be said for that as well. And, I, and I'm glad too. Like, okay, let me ask you this: at the end of the film, or toward the end of the film, when they blow up the space shuttle and they kill Riot that's that's in the the shuttle and then they're falling back toward the water and then Venom basically uses um himself to shield Eddie he says goodbye Eddie did you think that that was the end of Venom no i i i knew there was going to be some part of me that uh either he was going to find a scrap of that that uh, symbiote DNA or something, and he was gonna like eat it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I knew he would find something, or they would they would make it work. I didn't think that was gonna be the end. But again, that goes to the complexity of Venom as a character, where he's trying to save Eddie Brock, and he is evil, but he's more than that. He's more than just that. This bad guy. I I, I thought that was very well done. It was, it was really well done because he, when he said goodbye, Eddie, I was like, Oh wow. And I, and I was wondering, I'm like, okay, are we going to, is he going to come back or what, how are they going to end this film? And it would have been interesting if that's how they ended it. Yeah. And if, if this was solely just like a venom film and that was going to be it and whatever, I would think, wow, this parasite is saving his host, which is totally opposite of what a parasite does. Right. Yeah. And, and I really loved how all of a sudden you heard his voice again when he was talking with, um, what's his, what's, what's the character's name yeah. in the film? Uh, the, his love interest. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll look it up. But I thought it was cool how they were just sitting on the steps there and it's seeming like, like he's back to normal. Obviously he looks better. 
And then out of nowhere, the voice comes back. And the first time I saw it, actually both times I watched it, I found myself smiling because it was just like, oh, good, he's back, as opposed to, oh, no, he's back. And so, I don't know, it's, it's, it's one of those types of situations that it makes me think about how fun it is when you have a film that is successful in telling more of like an anti-hero story. And Venom, it's, you know, again, Venom is more of a villain, although in this film it's kind of like he started out as, as a villain, but then kind of turned into an anti-hero kind of thing. But did you find out what, what the character's name is? Uh, Annie or Anne. I That's think. right. Yeah. Okay. They're simple enough. So what else can we talk about with this film? Steve? Talking about a hundred miles an hour here. I think we're, we're pretty, uh, stoked to talk about this you know it kind of reminded me a little bit of spawn in a sense yes me too <laughs> i had the same kind of reaction <laughs> but which is was, not a bad thing not a bad thing but they but a lot of a lot of technology has happened since <laughs> Spawn. <laughs> yeah uh, actually there was a scene too when eddie was first eating a lot of like the raw chicken and well not raw but like the spoiled chicken that right. was in the trash and the frozen tater tots and stuff that actually reminded me of that uh, one film and it just um Oh, and I'm killing myself. I can't remember what it's called. It's the the film that takes place where the guy comes in contact with some other kind of like alien spray and he's slowly turning into one of the aliens that's on Earth. And so like there's a moment where like he starts eating cat food and that sort of thing, but his body hasn't fully. What the that heck? District 9. Thank you. Yeah. I kept thinking Johnny Five. I'm like, I know it's not Johnny Five. <laughs> District 9. Did you ever see that film? Yeah, I did. Okay. Um, that was actually one of my favorite parts of District 9 in the sense that I, I appreciated how they were exploring how the, his body had not fully converted. It, it was in transition to becoming this alien creature, which loved the, the catnip and the, the I, guess it was, I guess it was catnip, it's yeah. the, whatever it was. But his body got real sick and he rejected it and stuff. I, don't, I just To me, the, seeing something like that it reminds me of just how digestion is a very tangible quality that you can showcase in a film and it just feels more real. Like you could almost be with that character. And I think it was the same thing in this where like he's eating the chicken and that sort of thing. And then he ends up puking in the toilet. By the way, M Dib says that the second Fitta movie is going to be out next year. Oh, in October, right in time for Halloween. Well, and I think the first Venom movie was released in October. Could have been. I think it was. After seeing this film, are you excited to see the sequel? No, I, I definitely am. I, uh, I'm going to go with my gut. This oh, time, Russ. As well you should. <laughs> Is there anything else that you'd like to say? Because if not, I'm going to go right into the IMDb. I said go right into IMDb. All right. We have some trivia here, courtesy of IMDb. Tom Hardy's son, Lewis Thomas Hardy, is a fan of Venom, and Hardy took the role to please him. Quote, I wanted to do something my son could watch, so I did something where I bite people's heads off. <laughs> End quote. Uh, Lewis also guided his father on how to appropriately portray Brock slash Venom, since Hardy did not know the character very well. These are great stories. And this type of thing does tend to happen in Hollywood where the actor's kids will convince their parent to play a certain role because they're huge fans of it. And then everybody benefits. Tom Hardy recorded his lines for the Venom symbiote during pre-production and they were played back to the actor through an earpiece on set during scenes where Brock and the symbiote talk to each other. Oh, that's so cool. Isn't that neat? That is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. The Venom symbiote recommends chocolate. Uh, according to the 1995 miniseries Venom, The Hunger, symbiotes need a chemical called, oh, my goodness, it's phenethylamine. <laughs> Basically, it tastes like chocolate, but it's made out of just science. Well, apparently, it's available in both brains and chocolate. That is so funny. Isn't that funny? Which makes sense because in the film, he keeps eating people's heads. Yeah. That is funny. <laughs> Funny, and it's also funny that he, I, 
wanted chocolate from being on Earth because everyone loves chocolate. Well, yeah, except, except for you. Well, I like uh, chocolate. <laughs> Just you're you're more the chocolate boy out of the two of us. Tom Hardy did a ton of improvising off various weird bits he noticed in various filming locations, including the infamous lobster tank scene where Eddie climbs in and takes a seat in a lobster aquarium as he's burning up from a fever. That was totally not from the script. He just did that. (laughs) That's one of the many reasons why I enjoy watching Mr. Tom Hardy. Besides portraying Eddie Brock, Tom Hardy also provided the voice and physical stand-in for several scenes of Venom. That, of course, goes without saying. Let's see here. You know what, oh. I, what I hope they do? Sorry to cut you off. Well, I you're good. Say this, Russ. <clears throat> I, I do hope they up the, the resolution a bit in the next movie. Because that was one thing that was kind of noticeable where I thought, man, yes. you know, I, I, I want to watch this movie in a 4K resolution, but I don't know if that's going to be a drawback because it seems like the resolution was down a bit to what we're used to. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. I noticed that too. There were certain scenes where there was almost like a blurriness that was happening. And I, I I wonder if there was just a, a problem when they recorded the principal photography where the lens wasn't focused correctly. Cause like, especially during the certain scenes with, um, the guy that riot takes over the, the CEO dude, there were certain scenes where I'm like, man, like the top and bottom portions seem awfully blurry. And I don't know if that was intentional or not, but anyway, it wasn't so bad that like, like it was, I only noticed it in a few scenes. I didn't notice it throughout the, the movie itself. Venom's line eyes, lungs, pancreas, so many snacks, so little time comes from amazing Spider-Man number 374. It's fantastic. I love it when they do that. Tom Hardy describes Venom as a tragic clown. There's something funny about the circumstances of having a tragic gift. It's a superpower you don't really want, but at the same time, you love it. It makes you feel special. He's both a reluctant hero and an anti-hero. Yeah, I'm That's kind of spot on. The restaurant scene was shot once with the live lobsters and once with the fake lobsters. The lobster that Tom Hardy bites into was actually candy-coated marshmallow filling with chocolate syrup. Yummy. I bet that tasted pretty good. Did he pull that out of the water, though? Yeah. Hmm. I mean, if it's hardened and then it's not going to melt. Interesting. Interesting. And Wang works for, that's the love interest, a law firm called Michelini and McFarlane. Oh, the tire company, right. These (laughs) are the names of Venom's creators, Dave Michelini and Todd McFarlane. Right. How about them apples? Let's see here. The name of Brock's apartment building, Schuler, after Randy Schuler, a Marvel Comics fan who in 1982 suggested the idea of giving Spider-Man a black costume. The costume would debut in 1984 and would later evolve into the concept of a sentient alien being and later into a symbiote. See, it's little things like that. They just place it in like there's nothing by accident or happenstance when it comes to that sort of thing in the film. And that's what we call good story down there. (laughs) Tom Hardy considers Venom the coolest Marvel hero because he has a brazen swagger and a zero foxtrot attitude. Okay. (laughs) When asked about what it was like working with Tom Hardy, Michelle Williams told Screen Rant, one of the things that I so appreciate about working with him is that he's able to find what's real. Even when you're dealing with monsters and really wild physicality and language that you've never said before ever, he's able to find what really grounds it. I totally agree. Yeah. I mean, I I think that's one of the jewels in the crown of this film that actually got me on board. Yeah, no, he, he definitely owned the role. Tom Hardy cites the Ren and Stimpy show from 1991 as an influence on the relationship between Eddie Brock and Venom. I always saw Venom as a lounge lizard and Eddie Brock as an everyday kind of guy who's inherited this massive ego beast. (laughs) (laughs) Tom Hardy based his performance as Eddie Brock slash Venom on three actors. Woody Allen who was more of the, the tortured neurosis and all of the humor that can be, that can come from that. The martial artist fighter, Connor McGregor. Ah, Connor. Yeah. The taste and capability for Uber violence and red man out of control, living rent free in his head. 
So it was kind of an interesting little uh, combo there. The film released in the 30th anniversary year of Venom's debut in Marvel Comics, which was May 1988. In June 2017, Marvel producer Kevin Feige confirmed that the movie would not be set in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. However, Amy Pascal contradicted this by saying it would. It was later announced that same month <laughs> that Venom is its own universe. No, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Like, would you prefer it to, to exist in the MCU universe, or do you like how it's its own universe? I like how it's its own universe. And why is that? Well, because we're 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 total MCU overload right now. We need a different feel. Everything is MCU. I like a different flavor, Russ. You know, you can only eat so much of the same thing before your body says, "Hey, give me something else." You I know. Understand. I understand. I get you on that. Prior to the film's second trailer being released, it was rumored that the movie would only feature the Venom character during the film's final act. Fans were relieved when the second trailer released, showing plenty of scenes with the character. The final film also heavily featured Venom in action sequences, though Tom Hardy has revealed that 30 to 40 minutes of the film, including his favorite sequences, were removed. Wow. 30 to 40 minutes. Really? Really? Wow. It does make me wonder if there is an extended director's cut. Well, I might have to go around. pick this one up. Yeah. I would do a little Amazon search. 30 to 40 minutes. That's considerable there. Especially, like, I want to know, like, what Tom Hardy's favorite scene was. Director Ruben Fleischer wanted to make sure Venom looked tonally not totally, but tonally. Right, yes. Different from other comic book movies. In a recent interview, he said, quote, I wanted to make a darker, grittier, kind of edgier comic book movie that also has a strong horror element, which is inherent to the character and the comic. Yes. Those were the aspects. Thank darker, you. Darker, edgier, grittier. Thank you, yes. I believe he was successful. He was. Thank you for that. Didn't they pull the rating from an R down to PG-13? Uh, it sure does feel like it. It really felt like it could have been, if they wanted to make it R, it would have been easy. Not even with the language. I felt like, okay, they brought the violence down so they could got the, got the PG-13, but they wanted to make it edgy, and so they scripted a bunch more cussing in there so they could keep the edginess. I don't know. I I, I would have liked to have seen a... If, okay, so one of <laughs> one of my criticisms maybe for the film was that, okay, yeah, the script could have definitely been better because it just seemed like everybody was just throwing cuss words yeah. way too much than regular dialogue would have been. Well, and, and that's kind of indicative of, uh, or excuse me, indicative of a PG-13 rating. Exactly. That, that happens a lot. It doesn't have to be that way. It just ends up, but I feel like if they had maybe the extra resources or they went for the R and I don't know, I don't know. It does make me wonder if the 30 to 40 minutes that got removed are the source material or, um, yeah, it is the source material that gave it the R rating. And, you know, these comic book movies that are rated R, that are like Deadpool rated R. Yeah. Or Logan. Yeah. They're fantastic. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're amazing. So I wonder why. I wonder. Yeah. I, I mean, I think they just wanted to get the, the younger comic book fan uh, to go see the movie, which that wouldn't have happened otherwise. But I wonder if the movie would have been more successful had they gone for more of an R rating and just went, OK, it's going to be violent. It's going to be gritty. And this is how it's supposed to be in the comic book anyway. So we're just going to go with this. Well, and the other thing, too. It, yeah. I just go, I really hope that there is some kind of extended edition or unrated version or something like that, right. because that's part of what makes Venom so gruesome too. I mean, like you, you see how he was biting the heads off of people and you kind of sort of see it happen. Yeah, and I don't, I don't need to see that necessarily, you know, but like, I just, I think there needs to be some level of gore, not a ton, but there right. needs to be something there where it's like, yeah, this, this is a deadly symbiote. Right. This, this alien species is nothing to be trifled with. It's, it's man. It, it I think it would, it, it, at the very least, it would reinforce that sense of unpredictability that's going on. We're like, well, do I trust it or not? <laughs> it's in my body. <laughs> it's in my head. 
<laughs> Hopefully he won't cause destruction. The Malaysian market scene was filmed on a dirt <laughs> lot in Rex, Georgia. That was heavily dressed by set decorator Larry Dias and his crew. Good job, Larry. Hmm. Yeah, you know, Malaysia and Georgia kind of look the same. <laughs> This is the fourth Marvel movie set in San Francisco following Hulk of 2003, Ant-Man of 2015, and Ant-Man and the Wasp of 2018. Right. So San Fran is getting some representation, despite the fact that most of the films seem to take place more in New York. New York-y areas. There's like so many other places in the country. Why why can't we have other places? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, you know they they went to the or uh, in Infinity War they went to the Philippines. <laughs> hey, uh, yeah, yes, uh, uh, true. The airport where the old woman takes over the small girl's body is actually the Georgia World Congress Center in Atlanta. <laughs> Not even San Fran. <laughs> well, because you're you're made to wait. Hold on a second here. Takes over the small girl's body. Well, no, that they were still in Malaysia. Were they? Yeah, they, remember the old lady was like at the airport where they were getting ready to leave Malaysia to go back to San Francisco, and then the the old lady follows the girl into the bathroom. Yes, that was before uh, they arrived. Oh yeah! I have a random question for you, Steve. Yes, Ross. Which performance did you like better of Tom Hardy's, Bane or Venom? Eddie Brock slash Venom. Yeah, um, I would have to say Venom, uh, not because we just watched it, Russ, not because we just watched it, but with Bane, you don't get as, I, I didn't see as much of the voice matching the nonverbal language per se, because he had his mask on the entire time. Right. Uh, and so a lot of the, the flamboyant kind of, uh, speech, I didn't really think matched the, the, like his, his persona, his walking around with, you know, being the Bane character. Um, so to me, it didn't really fit. There was always, it was a bit uncomfortable. Really? Yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't a big fan. I mean, I'm, it, I'm surprised. I, I thought for sure that you liked his performance as Bane. I thought it was fine. I it, I think it's just because he had the mask on. I couldn't see Tom Hardy's face. You know, rather this, you see his face. The voice does match. Tom Hardy's playing two characters in one, mm-hmm. and I don't know. It, it, he, I I just I liked it better. I liked him better here. You, Russ. It's hard for me to say. Because I'm asking you a question, Russ. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> and this somehow gives you power <laughs> over me. <laughs> I was born in the dark. I don't know. I do not know. I, I for one, really liked his performance as Bane. I think that he was very intimidating and terrifying in The Dark Knight Rises. Uh, I think that... Uh, Christopher Nolan's vision of Bane was really, really cool. I think it was just dreadful watching that initial fight between Bane and Batman where he's, I mean, he is just pummeling Bat- Batman. He, Batman is so outmatched. And then it was equally as amazing and intense to watch the the rematch, so to speak, in the snow where like, I mean, Batman is now back up and at a hundred percent. And like, you just see this dr- like knockdown drag out brawl fest going on. I mean, it, it was, it was really, really cool. But I also liked how he portrayed Bane as someone who's actually quite wise. He right. wasn't some yeah. sort of mindless ogre, you know, like he actually had a lot that just really, I mean, I think it actually made him even more scary. It wasn't like he was like book smart, but he definitely had, he wasn't like the, the, the brainless kind of stereotypical brawny guy. Yeah. All he could do is break stuff. Yeah. Or like taking orders from another villain or something like that. Like he actually had a lot of street smart wisdom where he could tell when someone was doing something like, like other people always made the mistake that they felt like they had the upper hand, but really they were just playing right into Bane's trap whatever trap that was. And it was brutal too. Like when he was often people, uh, due to the, the, the brutal physicality is almost mortal combat style. <laughs> 
But at the same time in Venom, you know, it, it was such a, a pleasure watching him play this other character. I mean, he's, he's just a fantastic actor. I just love watching everything that he does. I'll have to get back to you on that, Steve. I'm not quite sure. Mm. <laughs> that takes a lot of pondering on my part to be able to know for sure. Didn't know I was going to flip it back on you, did I? I had an inkling. But yeah. I, yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's a good one for me to think about. <laughs> Man. Well, I may have to revisit that in the next episode of Joygasm. During the end credit scene, any interviews in Inmate, played by Woody Harrelson, who says, when I get out of here, and I will... There's going to be Carnage. The character is Cletus Cassidy, who would become Carnage after a symbiote used him as a host. And I really, 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 really hope that we see Carnage in the sequel because you're going to see a very distinct difference between how Venom's persona is versus Carnage. And a lot of it, what's interesting is that there's almost like a residual impression that's left on the symbiote depending on who the host is that that they bond with it's very i don't know it's really neat from a storytelling perspective but that's why venom is not as brutal as carnage because eddie still i mean he's he 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 means well he's just you know he's not the most like straight and narrow kind of guy so that's why where the whole anti-hero thing kind of comes into play however the serial killer is way different mm, in the right. symbiote that bonds with him. I and mean, you're seeing all kinds of crazy stuff going on. And all I got to say is they better have that rating be R because you've got to show just how over the top carnage is that really dwarfs what Venom does. It's if a parasite was to take over Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> the last film featuring a Stanley cameo to be released during his lifetime before his death of November 12th, uh, 2018. I'm not sure where that falls into place with Avengers Endgame. I'm not sure like when they recorded because they, they were recording quite a few of his cameos, like kind of back to back because they knew that the right. time was limited. So I'm not sure if this statement was because the Avengers Infinity War and Endgame hadn't been released yet, or if this is actually, no, this was literally like the last cameo that they filmed. It was nice seeing him in the film. It was. It's always nice seeing him in the film. It's, uh, plural. <laughs> in the comics, Riot was merely the brute to the Life Foundation symbiote squad and not particularly powerful. All he could do was shapeshift his limbs into blunt weapons like hammers and maces. He is upgraded to big bad in this movie, not only b being able to shapeshift into sharp objects and being more deadly, but also being Venom's superior in power. I had no idea. That answers my question. Like, I thought I wasn't sure if Riot was movie only or if they got him from the comics. Apparently, There you go, Russ. Just in the comics. I got to get caught up on my... Jeez, comic book Russ, read read a book i mean a, a, a comic book <laughs> cletus cassidy is introduced writing the message welcome eddie onto the bars of his cell with his own blood while waiting for eddie to arrive his first comics appearance as carnage had him do the same with his victims with the words carnage rules scrawled on the walls of the crime scene and i remember that because i have that comic there you go. I made up for the last little thingy that I didn't know nice. about. <laughs> and finally, this is the second film where Woody Harrelson plays a sociopathic serial killer. The first was, of course, Natural Born Killers from 1994. <laughs> and that is your trivia courtesy of IMDb. So, Steve, what are your final thoughts and star rating for Venom? Well, I don't know if my star rating is biased because I, I wanted to see it and finally did see it, and it was pretty much what I was hoping for, um, or <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with that. I'm gonna say that. Um, you know, I'm just gonna give it a three and a half. Three? Really? I thought, it I thought it'd be higher. Um. Yeah, I'm going to go stick with three and a half. I'm going to stick with three and a half. I, I liked it. Um, I think it was just restrained because of budget. 
And you could definitely tell the first half of the movie was definitely done very, very well. I loved the origin story. I loved how they took their time. I loved getting to know Eddie. I loved how they told basically how they were, you know, there's a split, the space exploration and they, you know, they kind of got the host or excuse me, the somebody out back who took over the host, whatever. And in the second half of the movie, it did start to speed up real quick. Okay. Uh, you know, Venom started really bonding with Eddie Brock. And like, it seemed like, okay, we could need, we started needing to hit these, these points really <laughs> quick here. We only got two hours. We gotta, we gotta hit it. Uh, pick so, up the pace. Yeah, so everything started to really pick back up, which was fine, but I wanted them to cut. I wanted to, I, I could actually use another hour of the movie to yeah. be quite honest. I, I would really like another hour. I would have been very happy to see like, well, like, like I said, another 30 to 40 minutes at yeah. least. Yeah. I think that the film was really, really exciting. I think it was so funny to me. Like I said earlier in the program about how I was so mistaken in this film. I thought it was really, really enjoyable there's been kind of this reoccurring theme that's been happening with a lot of films that we've been watching. And I've been mentioning this where there are certain risks creatively speaking that are are being taken and they have been paying off quite nicely. And while I would like to see a film that sticks to the comic book origin story, and I don't know if they're going to be doing this in the future or not, it could probably be argued that, there was technically kind of an exploration of that with the Sam Raimi version with Spider-Man three. But I did think that the film itself was a lot of fun. I think Tom Hardy should be commended because he really did carry the film. I think that the other actors did a nice job of supporting Tom Hardy in terms of the exposition and, and just what he was going through and the look of Venom and the, the persona of Venom, I thought, was just perfect. I really was happy with the just how he carried himself, how he was presented. And again, just the, the idea of how there was this ongoing relationship where you could feel the, the meshing of Eddie Brock and Venom going on. And so I, for one, am looking forward to the, uh, the sequel that comes out next year. So I think... I'm I think I'm willing to give it I'm going to say 4 stars. And uh yeah, I think that the sequel itself again it's going to depend on what's going on. I'm definitely going to listen to the the gut feeling of it. But I'm anticipating that if they continue going down this path and doing what they're doing the rating on the sequel may actually potentially be higher. I think that, that there's potential for it to be 4.5. Maybe even the elusive five stars. You know, you never know. Well, that wraps up this episode of Joygasm. Make sure you tune in next week. Thanks for hanging out with us. If you enjoyed this episode, we invite you to check out patreon.com slash joygasm and consider becoming a monthly contributor. You'll get exclusive perks and early access to the show. Not to mention, it really helps us continue doing what we love to do. Also, you can follow us on social media and YouTube. Just do a search for Joygasm TV. In addition to iTunes and Android, you can listen to our podcast on TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, Spotify, and soundcloud.com slash joygasm TV. Last but not least, search Joygasm TV on Twitch to see us stream our gaming adventures live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Central Time. We will see you next week. Later.